Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Randy Bussey about organizational culture and employee engagement to drive employee and organizational success. Randy Bussey, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. I'm happy to be here to chat with you. Yeah, I'm super excited for our conversation today. We're going to be discussing a topic that is near and dear to my heart. We've talked about it on the podcast before, um, but Randy, you come to us uh, with a really great background and a bit of a unique perspective. And so I'm excited to explore this topic again with you today. We're going to be focusing on healthy organizational cultures and how to better engage employees to drive employee and organizational success. That's a big topic. There's a whole bunch of things we could uh, explore there. So it'll be fascinating to see how this conversation unfolds. As we get started, I wanted to share Randy's bio with everybody. Randy Bussey, president of Workforce Development Group, has been helping employees to delight customers for more than 25 years. Her programs help employees to think like an owner, not a renter, yielding rave reviews from her clients because the culture of their organizations change and their customers rave about them. She's co-author of the book, Turning Rants into Raves, Turn Your Customers On Before They Turn On You, written for CEOs, business owners, and managers that want to improve the experience they are providing to their customers. Randy is a dynamic speaker with the ability to make audiences listen, nod, laugh, and connect the dots between their own experiences as a customer and how their behaviors and the way their employees treat customers affects their bottom line. Uh, Again, so wonderful to have you. I'm super excited to to take a customer-centric focus to this often discussed topic of organizational culture and employee engagement. Uh, Before we launch on into the conversation, anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your personal background or context? Well, um, I'm a customer first and we're all customers. And I'd like to think that what I bring to the table is a seat at the table for your customers because often we're talking about our products and our services and our policies and processes, and we're not considering how that is affecting our ultimate end user customer. So uh, I represent your customer in, in all conversations and, uh, and give them a voice, if you will. Yeah, that's really great. And we def- I, I'm a big fan of people-centric organizations and people-centric organizations focus both internally on uh, the people within the organization, the employees and, and key constituencies, uh, but also on, on external uh, stakeholders and, and the customers. We can't take customers for granted. So customer loyalty, uh, customer commitment, uh, brand loyalty, these are all things that are driven largely by the quality of their experience with our employees, the people in the organization. And so we have to think carefully about how we shape our organizational culture, how we engage our employees. uh, So our our employees can feel connected to the organization's mission, vision, value proposition, and deliver that to the customers in a way that will, you know, drive success for everybody. Yeah. And you make a really good point because our, our employees are our internal customers. And they're also our brand advocates. They are the face, they are the voice of our brand. And so if you want to have engaged customers, you have to have engaged employees. If you want to have loyal customers, you have to have loyal employees. And, you know, that's not something that's going to show up on somebody's resume. You know, I'm a loyal employee. 
Um, so it, it's just as important inside the organization, which will ultimately impact the, the outside the organization with your external customers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's start with engagement. We know there are many studies that talk about uh, employee engagement and Gallup puts out their annual report. We know that the actively disengaged is, incre is an incredibly high number. The vast majority of employees are not engaged at work and, and a subset of those not engaged or actively disengaged. So the number of engaged employees tends to be around a third of employees. Um, and then you, you couple that with the fact that the super engaged employees, kind of that the, the top maybe 10%, they're in danger of burnout because they're overly engaged. So there's like this sweet spot that we want to find where someone can be engaged, committed, loyal, productive uh, in a sustainable way uh, without burning out and without slipping into disengagement. And really, we're only talking 20% of employees that kind of tend to fit in that zone. And so the question is why? Like, why can't we we expand that? Why can't we have more just healthily, sustainably engaged employees making contributions, feeling fulfilled at work, um, finding meaning and purpose and, and translating that meaning and purpose to the customers? Mm. Well, you know, one of my favorite sayings, Jonathan, is the fish thinks from the head down. And so, you know, what is leadership speaking? What are they saying? And more importantly, what are they doing? Because they could say one thing and then act in you know, a 180 degree um, behavior. And so our employees are watching us and they're listening to us and they're taking their cues from us. And so if we talk about you know, our customers are the most important and we need to treat them well, but then we overhear them talking trash about a customer who maybe just complained to them about something, well, I don't know which, which part of you should I be listening to. Customers are gold or, oh, that customer is a pain in my you-know-what. And so uh, like our children who watch everything that we say and do, so do our employees. So we need to check ourselves in the mirror, the leaders of the organization, to make sure that we are walking the talk and modeling the kind of behavior with our employees that we want our employees to demonstrate with our customers. Yeah, and that really connects, I guess, to the next point about uh, organizational culture. And there's lots of conversation about who drives organizational culture. Um, now, I'm a firm believer that every individual within an organization can contribute to a healthy culture and that we should all see ourselves as change agents and as leaders, regardless of a formal title, formal role. But to your point, the reality is that, you know, from the C-suite on down, messages are sent. And, and when messages, you know, whether it's what you say, uh, whether that's in alignment with your behaviors, the, your employees will get a clear message of what you value and what they're going to be evaluated on according to what you value. Uh, yeah. So you can say you're, you value customer experience and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, if, if uh, your, your K, certain KPIs and metrics driven decisions uh, about performance and bonuses and such, if those reign supreme, even when they're at the expense of customers, guess what's going to happen? Of course, lo and behold, uh, you're going to cut corners, you know, uh, not individuals necessarily, but collectively, you're going to have people that cut corners, you're going to have eroded customer loyalty and trust and customer experience. Um, because people are going to chase the metrics that are established that are, you know, that, that they're being evaluated on, and they're going to follow behaviors more than they're going to follow whatever rhetoric comes out of top leadership. So while I need to take personal responsibility for my own um, engagement and fulfillment at work, and I need to connect my passion and my values to the work that I do, I need to take personal ownership over that. And I can't necessarily expect anyone else to connect the dots for me or help do that for me. Really, I mean, honestly, organizations should be doing that. I, I've learned that I can't expect anyone to do that for me. I can't expect a leader or an organization to take that seriously and that, that responsibility seriously. So I try to be proactive, but organizations need to be doing that and they need to be doing it from the top down. They need to be setting the example. And when they don't, they're just shooting themselves in the foot because mm -hmm. it, it's, it's the healthy organizational cultures that will help you attract and retain, retain great people. You'll have a clear uh, employee value proposition 
uh, that will help you get and keep the best people. You will get the best performance out of them and, and find they'll, they'll have engagement. And then that'll translate over into the customers and you'll have that clear value proposition of the organization transfer to the customer. When you have unhealthy cultures, toxic cultures, overly, you know, hyperly competitive, um, dysfunctional cultures, uh, what inevitably ends up happening is people, you know, they, they chase the numbers and they cut corners and uh, they're going to be looking out for number one, not necessarily their team or the organization. Mm -hmm. And we can do better. Organizations and leaders need to do better. Yeah, there's so many things that you just mentioned that I want to touch upon. Um, you know, a lot of times you go into an organization and, you know, there's a sign on the wall, the customer is king or the customer is always right. Or you, um, you look on a, an organization's website and their vision and mission, and often they talk about um, customer service or the, you know, the, the customer experience. And you know, those words on a wall or words on a website are often meaningless. And the thing is that when we put something on our website, that's a promise that we're making to our customers. And if we're not living that promise, get it off your website because, you know, I come to expect, right? Customers have expectations and they're based on not only what you tell us, but what you, what you show us. And so it's important that the words on a wall or the words on a website are not just words on a wall. They're, they need to be embodied and they need to, you know, start at the top and run throughout the organization. But a lot of companies that I go into, uh, they don't know what the values are. And um, there's no connecting of the dots because the dots haven't necessarily been laid out in a way that um, that makes sense. And so as leaders, it's important for us to get buy-in to the mission and vision of the organization and to walk the talk, right? Um, we, we have to place the same importance on internal employees uh, internal customers, our employees, as we do on external. Um, you know, you talk about, um, you didn't say this specifically, but everybody wants to be an employer of choice, right? Um, and so just like companies no longer own their brand anymore because customers own their brand, well, to be an employer of choice, you have to engage your workforce so that they are speaking kindness about your organization so that they take pride in, in what they're doing. And so just like customers have review sites like Yelp and TripAdvisor and, and Facebook, which you know the, the most of the population has, so do employees. And I was doing an exercise a couple of years ago and I searched on Twitter for hate customers, for that term, hate customers. And I can't tell you how many hundreds, if not thousands of tweets were being posted by employees of organizations. I hate my customers. You know, I, I hate my customers because of this. I hate when my customers ask me to do something when I'm going on a break. I mean, and so these are the people that are taking care of our customers and, you know, they're, they're spouting this negativity about them hating customers, like it's oil and water, it, it doesn't mix. And so how do organizations become the brand of choice, not just for the customer, but also for the employee? And that's the, that's the million dollar question, right? Yeah, and and when you were describing that example of the the tweets uh, and the, and the one employee um, complaining, you know, I think about that now. Certainly, there are just some employees that just you know have a bad day or a bad attitude. They're you know maybe the the bad egg of the bunch, and maybe the rest of the organization's great, and the rest of the employees have good attitudes, and it has a, overall a good culture. But typically, that's indicative of something, right? If, if, if you have employees complaining online like that, that's probably reflective of a broader condition within the organization. Um, and an employee wouldn't complain about having to help a customer to go on a break. You know, when it's time to go on a break and the customer asks for help and now I have to go help the customer. They won't complain about that if their employer will still honor their breaks 
Um, but the reason people complain is because their employer in that particular kind of situation, their employer sent, you know, the boss sends them on a break. They have 15 minutes. Now someone asks them for help and now they only have 10 minutes left for their break and their boss doesn't give them an extra five minutes. That, that's exploitation, right? And so of course they're upset. I would be upset. Uh, and of course they're gonna end up venting in some way. Now, hopefully they don't do it online, but that's, I mean, I don't know in that specific situation, but generally speaking, those types of things are indicative of how employees value their, or how employers value their people, how they ex share that, express that, um, and how they tend to either reinvest into their people or not. And mm -hmm. if you want a customer centric organization, you need a employee centric organization, bottom line. Um, if you're not treating your people well, if you're not paying them fairly and equitably, of course, they're, they're going to find way there's, there's, there's a, a theory in organizational behavior called equity theory. And it's, it's a simple idea that employees are going to balance the scales, they're going to make whatever they're getting paid, whatever the experience they have, good or bad, they're going to balance it with the effort they put into their job. And mm -hmm. if, if they feel like they're getting cheated uh, on their pay or their breaks or their, their, their boss is, is harassing them, you know, being a bully, guess what's going to happen? They're going to pull back. They're going to disengage. They're going to do the bare minimum. They're going to clock in, clock out, whatever, right? And that's going to lead to a really poor customer experience. So clearly, we, we need, like you've said it several times, we need to walk the walk. We need to focus on those core values um, and not only communicate them once, not only put them on the website or on the wall, embed them throughout the practices, processes, procedures of the organization, how employees are evaluated. And you have to continually come back to those things. You have to reiterate them over and over and over again. If I want to embed, you know, core principles, core values into the culture of the organization, I have to consistently do that over months and years uh, for that to really take hold. And I have to make sure that my actions are consistent with the words I'm using. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data-driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. I, I'm thinking of one particular organization that I was working with recently. They actually were doing the sustainability piece really well. Like they were consistent. They had been consistent. They had their clear messaging. They were you know, the C-suite on down, um, they, they were pretty good at sticking to their, their core value proposition messaging and to, to employees and to customers. Um, the problem was there were just so many examples of where their actions contradicted what they repeatedly said. And so all that did was undermine trust. Um, it just ticked people off and, and caused them to be resentful. Uh, and you know, in some ways it's worse than if they wouldn't have done it at all, if they hadn't continually espoused that value. Now it's a tricky thing. You know, if, if we're, if we're um, shooting to learn and to grow and to develop, we're going to have aspirational values and we won't necessarily have arrived at them yet. We have to work towards it. And so I get that and, and leaders need to get that. And you need to help your employees get that. Like this is a work in progress. We're trying to get better at this, but this mm -hmm. is an aspirational value we're going to work towards but they need to see like at least incremental improvements. And if they consistently see 
those same behaviors again and again and again that undermine the very value that's being espoused, you know, game over. The, the trust isn't going to be there. Yeah. Well, you know, you use the word invest, right? So organizations and employers need to invest in their employees. And, you know, it starts with when they're recruiting employees. Um, and, and how many people do you know that have sent, you know, resumes to organizations and never hear back? Or they go on an interview and they never hear back. Or they go on a second interview and they never hear back. And so, you know, I know organizations are inundated with, you know, candidates, but at the same time, um, would you treat your customers like that? Your, your prospective customers, would you be just like ignoring them because at the moment you weren't going to do business with them? Absolutely not. And, and so, you know, training um, is not a one-time event. It's an ongoing experience. And, you know, one... So the onboarding, Let, let's talk about, you know, onboarding. When you're onboarding an employee, what does that look like? Well, a lot of times it's not very um, in-depth. And, you know, I might tell you where the cafeteria is, and I'm going to tell you how many days of sick time that you have. And I might teach you about the products or services that we offer and how to use the computer system. But am I going to teach you about the value of customers, about the value of doing what you say that you're going to do? And, and if we're not discussing that and modeling that kind of behavior and having those conversations, well, who's to blame when employees kind of veer off? And speaking of employees veering off, you know, that takes me to the big A word, which is accountability. And are employers holding employees accountable? And, and when they're not, those super engaged employees that you talked about before start to say one of two things. Well, gee, Joe's not doing what he's supposed to be doing and nothing's happening to him. So why am I you know, busting my neck to go and do this? Let me just be like Joe because it doesn't really matter if I put in the effort or not, which then turns that employee into what I call rant. And rant is that renter employee who's not engaged, doesn't care, and oh, look, it's five o'clock, I have to go. And so the other thing that might happen to that high performer or that highly engaged employee is they say, you know what? It's bad enough that Joe's not doing what he's supposed to be doing, but my boss is not doing anything about it and he's not holding them accountable. And so now I start to lose respect for my boss. And then I think to myself, well, do I even want to be in this environment where I'm surrounded by people that don't value excellence the way that I do? So then I'm going to quit. And so either way, the company loses when accountability is not in, you know, integrated into the organization. Now, that doesn't mean micromanage them, but it means have expectations, communicate them, and when they're not met, address them because when you don't, you're part of the problem. Yeah. And, you know, people tend to, well, there's a certain, certain people, probably most people don't like uncomfortable conversations. And so they feel like in those, those performance evaluations, those performance feedback sessions that they're going to have to say negative things and that makes them uncomfortable. Uh, and so, you know, perhaps they take a passive aggressive approach instead of being direct uh, or they just ignore it or pretend like things are better than they are. Like there's a whole bunch of things that, that, that managers, supervisors tend to do instead of like the actual mentoring, coaching, um, providing the feedback that they need to do. Uh, but that's been my experience that the, the, the there, there, there's always exceptions of really great um, managers, supervisors, but the vast majority of them that I see and that I coach, they, they tend to look for excuses and justifications for not having those hard conversations. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's why the whole crucial conversations um, series and trainings were so successful because it's a huge problem. And, and there, it's, it's not rocket science. Like the, the principles are fairly straightforward for that, but the bottom line is you have to do it and you have to be consistent. Otherwise, like you said, you will undermine your own credibility, your own trust. People will see you as weak and ineffectual, ineffective, uh, and that says, that's nothing about your own, you know, your own work ethic, your own personal integrity, but they, they want to see fairness and equity and they want to 
know that if, you know, if I'm being held accountable for my work, and I, I want to know that other people are being held accountable. And also, so if, if we have other people on our team dragging us down, it's going to impact our performance. And so we just, high performers want to be around other high performers. Mm -hmm. And if you can't have that kind of an environment, they're going to tend to leave uh, eventually because they're going to feel um, unsupported and they're not going to feel like they're invested in. Uh, so we've gotten to this point a little bit already, but uh, as we get close to wrapping up, what would you say are maybe two or three of the main things that companies need to be doing, that leaders need to be doing consistently to set their employees up for success? Yeah, you know, it, it's that's a good question. And I know that employees, employers don't want to set their employees up for failure. However, more times than not, they do set them up for failure. And so um, it's about making sure that they're hiring for a cultural fit, right? You know, somebody on paper, you know, they have X number of years experience in my industry. Um, and I think, oh, you know, perfect. And so what about who they are as a person? Because, you know, there's the, the, the technical skills that you might bring, but then there's the soft skills. And the soft skills are not, they're not soft. Um, you know, they're, they're much more important because I can teach you how to run a machine. I can teach you the information that you need about a specific process, but I can't teach you how to care. I can't teach you how to be a good listener and be interested and be wanting to be part of a team. And so I think that those behavioral types of questions are really important, you know, from, from the get-go. I'm less concerned with what you know how to do and I'm more concerned with who you are and how you act as a human being relating to other human beings. Um, and, and so that doesn't show up on a resume, right? So, you know, you're using resume scanning tools and, and that's not gonna show. So you're gonna flag people that have the, the, you know, the number of years or that buzzword in their resume, but that doesn't necessarily make them a good fit. So I think that when we're doing our hiring, we need to pay more attention to who they are as a person because that's what you're hiring. You're hiring them as a person. And you know, we talk a lot about, you know, leave your personal stuff at home. Well, I don't know that that's necessarily good because I'm hiring you, Jonathan, as a person. And that encompasses everything in your life. Now, that doesn't mean if you're going through a tough time that I want you ruminating at work all about it, but I can't ask you to only bring part of yourself to work um, and it's only the good part. So I think that we need to be slower to hire and quicker to fire. And when we talk about firing, um, you don't have to fire anybody uh, because they fire themselves with their behavior, with their attitude. And we have to have the um, strength and courage as leaders to let those people go after ample warning and coaching and, and what have you. So it's about making better hiring decisions and letting people go um, sooner rather than later, because I've seen people, employees become hot potatoes yep, in organizations. Yep. They're not doing well here. Oh, let's transfer them to accounting. Well, they're not doing well here. Let's put them in production. All you're doing is moving um, a problem around instead of addressing it. So I'd like to see, I'd like to see organizations take more accountability and yeah. um, control that a little better. Yeah, I, I see that same problem a lot too. And it again comes back to leaders not being willing to make hard decisions. But to your point, I'm not even sure it's a hard decision if we do the work up front. So mm -hmm. if, if you're clear about expectations from the beginning, Right. right. From the time someone is interviewed, onboarded, you know, they come in during their um, their their early months, they're getting coached, they're getting mentored. Expectations are clear. Mutual accountability is clear. You're working to develop trust with them. If that environment exists, to your point, people will self-select out or they'll self-select in. They'll either decide they want to be there or they're going to decide they don't want to be there. And at that point, it should be a pretty easy conversation. Um, if I'm the, the manager, the supervisor, because they're, they're not a fit. They don't, it's clear they don't want to be there. They're not, they're not buying into what we're all about, what we're trying to accomplish. 
And so you just go and have a direct conversation with them. Um, yet that, that often doesn't happen. So yeah. we, we definitely need to do better. We need to do better earlier, uh, just setting up the, the conditions for mutual accountability to develop trust. Um, and that way everyone can support each other towards sustainable effort, sustainable high engagement. And to the point of what we were discussing a little bit earlier, that is directly linked. There's so much research on this. You want engaged, loyal, committed uh, uh, customers. You need engaged, loyal, committed employees, period. Yeah. Um, the, the, the relationship is crystal clear. And when you have poor employees, uh, poor employee engagement, uh, satisfaction, and et cetera, guess what? Your, your uh, customer scores are going to tend to be low and uh, you're going to struggle to, to retain your, your customers. Well, Randy, it has been a real pleasure. I, I'm mindful of the time and I see I probably need to let you go and get on with your busy day. But before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, uh, your business, your book, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Sure. So thank you for that. And uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with you about a topic that we're both obviously very passionate about. So my organization, Workforce Development Group, is uh, technically a customer service training organization. And it's not just about customer service. It's about the employee experience as well. And so companies reach out to me when employees are not engaged, not committed, and yes, I deliver customer service training and I help employees think and act like owners of the business. And then I give them the skills they need to delight customers. Uh, I am the author of a book called Turning Rants into Raves, Turn Your Customers On Before They Turn On You. Uh, Rant and Rave are two fictitious employees that work in every organization. Uh, the book is available on Amazon. You can learn more about my organization and my training programs by visiting my website. It is workdevgroup.com, and that's short for workforcedevelopmentgroup.com. And I'll just also give you my phone number, which is 516-578-8806. I'd love to be a resource, answer any questions, and help change the way companies are not only caring for their customers, but also for their employees. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much, Randy. It has been a real pleasure. I imagine we could probably talk about this and related topics all day long. Um, that'll have to suffice for now, but I'd love to have you back anytime and we can continue the conversation. I encourage listeners to reach out, to get connected with Randy, find out more about what she and her organization can do, check out her book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.